In the book, we're on page 126. Uh, let's go to the bottom of the page there because this is Revelations 10 and I think it's verse 4. Um, yeah, because at the top it says verse 1, which he talks about the, the, the mighty Malak there. And we saw how that would, Malak was the one who actually spoke with Daniel. It's the same one, the same being. So let's look down to the second to the last um, paragraph here. He says, when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, he says, you know, this is a different position or a different authority, a different rank that was held here when they had certain jobs to do, in other words. So when they had done it, it was, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up these things. He said, now if you remember, we see this in Daniel. Later he was showing this in the, is the end of the things that I want to show you at this time period. Okay, So he's showing that this is the end of things at a certain time period. Now this time period was, be, was is showing the time of the end at an earlier, much earlier time. He says, if you remember, there's a verse in Revelations that we will read that says, I'm going to show you that uh, things that have been, things that will be, and then things that will take place in the end. Okay, and that's the way that Yahweh works. He speaks, remember, it says, he speaks as though things are already done. That's the way that Yahweh operates in his great and awesome plan. That's why the plan was with Yahweh, and it's an active plan that's continually going he says the end involves the last work, okay? So this is how we know that we're, la that we're living in the last days, the end time period, because this is the work, the last work that Yahweh has. This is the last work that he's going to show you here as he showed Yachanan. This is the voice of the seventh messenger, okay? So, and remember, we know that when the seventh messenger speaks, you know, it, it's the time period in which he finishes, us, finishes up all that the prophets wrote about. So continuing on here in Revelations, he says, uh, I believe this is verse 4, 10 verse 4, seal these things up which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them. The seven thunders, um, let's see, seven thunders in, in oh, I can separate the page here, the seven thunders. This is in Revelation 10, 4, he says, And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, uh, this is in the sixth book of Israel, chapter 3, verse 74. Pastor says, The word thunder means a messenger who prophesies or warns people of a great storm that is coming to take place. It's speaking of the seven messengers. So this is the same being that's spoken of in Daniel 12. So notice the seven thunders, thunder means a messenger. Okay, So he's talking about the seven messengers, the, the message that the messengers are bringing forth. So he says, seal these things up when the seven thunders uttered and do not write them. Don't write these messages down, he said. In verse 5, And the Malik which I saw standing upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hands to heaven and vowed by him who lives forever, who created heaven and earth, the things that are in it and the things that are in it and the sea and the things that are in it, that there would be time no longer. Now if you remember... Uh, this lifting up was fulfilled in 9-9-2006. Now, in Revelation 10, 5, and 6, now here it says, And the Malik which I saw standing upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and vowed by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it and the earth and the things that are in it and the sea and the things that are in it, that they should be time no longer. You notice this is the same being that's spoken of in Daniel 12, so 7, and he's spoken of as being the man clothed in linen, okay? Who in that future day is teaching, notice when he held up his right hand and his left hand towards heaven, which is the same th thing you see up here. You lift up his hands to heaven, okay? Not just one hand, but hands, okay? You don't lift just one hand up to Yahweh. You lift up both hands. His right hand and his left hand towards heaven, and vowed by him who lives forever. Same thing you see here, right? In Revelation, vowed by him who lives forever. You see it, the same thing in Daniel. And it will be for a time, times and a half. You notice he says there will be time no longer, okay? And this is the time period he's talking about in Daniel. The time, the times, and the half. And Yahweh, when Yahweh has fin accomplished pouring out his power to his holy people, all these things would be finished, okay? 
the same as you see here, that it's going to be time no longer. It's going to be finished in the days of the seventh messenger, remember? Um, now he says here, um, oh, when he, in Daniel 12, when he, right, he lifts up his right hand and his left hand towards heaven. That right and that left actually means, you remember Pastor did that over here on the stage, okay? And he was facing this way. And right and left actually refers to the directions of north and south. So it actually shows you which direction he was actually standing in um, and, and actually which direction his hands were pointing towards, the, la- the north and the south. Now he goes on and shows here, he says, the diaglot shows here that this is the time, the time no longer delayed. Here is the Greek, this is the emphatic Greek diaglot. Daniel 12, 6, he says, And he swore by him who lives for the ages of the ages who created the heavens and the things in it and the earth and the things in it and the sea and the things in it, that the time should be no longer delayed. Okay? An emphasized Bible says, And he swore in the name of by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that they contain, and the earth and all it contains, and the sea and all that it contains. He swore that no more time should, could, notice, no more time should interfere and there should be no more waiting or delay. Okay? So it's definitely speaking about a time period, and this is why this is spoken of as being the end. It doesn't mean, that word end doesn't just mean the end of something completely. It means the end of a finished period of something. Okay? It's going to continue on afterwards in, in another way basically is what he's talking about when you look at that word in because it's not just the finished completeness of something something completely just done away with it means something that has been accomplished and as we read Yahweh's plan will be finished for mankind at that time which means not that it would be his plan would be over with because his plan is forever for man to exist forever and to rule forever it will always be his plan will always be it's forever but the plan for mankind's governments, remember, that will come to an end. The ruling of mankind by his own authority will come to an end. And then, of course, man's government will take over. Yeah, praise Yahweh. This will be the time of the, of the, of the seventh Moloch and the time of the, of the ending of man's governments of the people and by the people which are led by Satan, of course. You know, because it's not... It's not led by man, you know, I mean, man's government is not led, actually, it, it's led by man, man is, is, is there, but remember, he's being inspired and, 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 and taken over, his minds are being taken over to, to rule and copy and imitation of what the gods want him to do, you know, because remember, the god of this world has blinded the minds of the world, okay, so... The world is completely blinded by these things, and that's the way that they rule. They rule according to the way that the gods want them to rule. So he says, and this is what demonocracy is all about, right? And so you know that, that, uh, he says, as you know, that thing is going to prove that it comes to an end, and this will be the last time. And he says, "This now this time, if you get that in your mind, he says, This time that the prophets and the apostles all spoke of and is revealed so much in prophecy is the three and a half year period. You know, the prophets spoke about these things and the apostles spoke about these things. You know, they were looking for these things. They wanted to know and and understand this and see these time periods. But Daniel longed so much for it. But remember, he was told, no, Daniel, it's for the time of the end. It's not for your time. You've got to seal these things up. And it got Daniel physically sick because he really, really wanted to understand these prophecies. But it wasn't for his time period. It's, it's for us in these last days. Now highlight this, uh, this next sentence here. The last time, the last three and a half year period is to be severed, as Daniel said, or cut short by the Savior. And then here again in Revelation, shortened by moons. Okay? So highlight that section. The last time, the last three and a half years is to be severed, as Daniel said, or cut short by the Savior. And then here again in Revelations is shortened by moons, as it talks about. Now, this next verse is Daniel, I mean, uh, Revelations 
10 verse 7, he says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh Moloch, when he will begin to sound the great secret that is sealed at that time. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, it will be, okay. Well, let's go ahead and get this now. Okay, it's going to be shortened. Okay. In Daniel 12, 7, it says, It will be for a time, times, and a half. So you see the half, okay? So you see that that time there is shortened. Matthew 24, 22 says, Unless those days were shortened, and then it continues on and says those days will be shortened, okay? In Revelation 12, 12, Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because she knows she has but a short time. Okay, so it's cut short. And in Revelation 9, 28, For he will finish the work, yet cut it short in righteousness, because Yahweh will make a short work upon the earth. Okay, and it has to be. And this is what Yeshua was talking about when he said, you know, in, unless these days were cut short, Mankind wouldn't, wouldn't be able to exist, okay? It has to be cut short. So as it says in Romans, Yahweh is going to make a short work of righteousness here on this earth, okay? And this work in these end days, this short time period that we have left, it is going to be a very short time. Um, so he says, but in the days of the voice of the seventh Moloch, when he will begin to sound the great secret which is sealed at that time, Notice he says, seal it up. Don't write it. Do not say it. It's going to be brought out in the last days. Okay, only in the last days. Remember, it has to be for this last days because no other time period could man ever understand this. No other, no other time of man's history could he understand this. And this is why the commentators have such a hard time with the book of Revelations, because they don't understand it. When, you know, when they write about things, they write about things that they knew about. They, they refer a lot to the Roman Empire and stuff, but it's, not, it's, it's, it's talking about things that have taken place in history long past, but they don't have the understanding of what it means in these last days. And notice he says, he could have told you, okay, but it, it, notice, it says, seal it up, don't write it, don't even say it, don't say anything about it. It's going to be brought out in the days, in the last days. But he could have told us. He could have, he, he, he could have written these things down. He, he could have explained these things. But he didn't. You know, he didn't do that. He didn't do that for a reason. Um, now, when you look at Yachanah and Mark, 13, 19, and 20, he says, For in those days there will be tribulation, such as not from the beginning of the creation which Yahweh created. And of course, that includes the great turmoil when the, when the population had to be destroyed by the earth with the flood in Noah's time, when the microbes had to allow the flood to take place. Until this time, you know, this time spoken of by all the prophets, because this is the cutoff short time period known as the end. And never will be again. Now that's a promise that once Yahweh's plan is completed, mankind would not have to suffer again. In verse 20, And if Yahweh had not cut short those days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, that's us, whom he has chosen, notice, he has cut short the days. In other words, his plan will come to completion. It's going to accomplish his goal. And we will have the power to resurrect the dead and continue on cleaning up the earth for a thousand years and then go on from there. You know, we have our job cut up for us. So this time period has to, cut, has to be cut short because it's going to be that rough. And this is what you're going to see. You know, when you're reading Psalms, it talks about the protection of Yahweh, but you notice it also talks about that you are going to see death all around you. Now, we're not going to, see, we're not going to experience that but we are going to experience death around us. We're going to get that close to it to where you're going to see on the left side, on the right side, people dying off as we see these things. It's going to be that bad. In fact, it's going to be 
scary for some people. And if people are not rooted and grounded in the truth, they might just tuck tail and run, thinking that they can find protection somewhere else. And of course, they would die. Because this is the house of Yahweh. This is the only place. But notice he says, seal it up. Okay, He says, don't say it. It's going to be brought out in the last days. He could have told you. Why didn't he tell us? Why did he not tell us? Okay, let's see. Why is it not recorded in earlier times in the scriptures? Why? Because it is written. That's why. Notice in Jeremiah 23, verse 20. In the latter days, you will understand it perfectly. Not a, no other time period, but the latter days. Jeremiah 30, 24. In the latter days, you will understand it. In Daniel, he says, I've, made, I've come to make you understand what will befall your people in the latter days, for the vision is for many days to come. Right? So it's in the latter days. It's the only time period that he has, he's spoken about that he says that Yahweh's people will be, be able to understand what his plan is all about. No one else could actually fully comprehend it because it wasn't meant for them. In Hebrews 1, 2, it says, He has in these last days spoken to us through his Son. So we had to wait until our high priest came in order to teach Yeshua Messiah. Remember in, in, in Zechariah 6, 12, 11 through, through 13, how it talks about that Yeshua and the man known as a branch would work together in these last days. Okay, So that's the reason why it wasn't written. I mean, it, it wasn't written down for us because it is written that it would be in the last days that these things would be revealed. Okay, that's a really powerful statement. And, and really, it is written. It is written. That's all you need to know. You get it? It is written. Now, who's going to understand that? Only those who have spirit of Yahweh can comprehend that. It is written. That is some very powerful words, but it is so astounding, the meaning behind it. It is written. Okay, because remember, the wicked will never understand. Remember Daniel said that? Daniel said the wicked will never understand. This is why the, the world can't understand these things, but it is written. And that's the way that Yeshua always answered. He says, it is written. Do you, have you not read? Is it not written in your law? You know, trying to get him to point out to look at your own law that you're talking about in his day. And that's why he, he met so much opposition. Okay. So, he says here, it could have been written in the scriptures exactly what we're facing right now with the 125 sexually transmitted diseases and nuclear bombs that can destroy a whole city or a state and that will have lasting effects for years and years and years. He says, I was just reading in the history that was put out about the two atom bombs that were dropped, one on Hiroshima and the other on Nagasaki. It was some 15 years later that people started coming down with things in the United States, and children were being born with things that actually got to them from these two explosions. It kind of shows you the doctors and the scientists know that this is where it came from. Okay, Now, these things can affect people because, remember, when it goes up to the air in the sky, you know, a, a, a ground, a, I mean, a, an air burst, ground burst would do the most damage and stuff, but an air burst is the worst because, you know, it, it, it explodes. I mean, a, a ground burst is, a, is the worst because it sucks up all of the dust and the ashes and throws it up into the air and gets into the air currents and it goes around the earth, you know, and it can take about two weeks and that, that will be here, okay? So... After the, the first bomb goes off, within that short amount of time, it's going to be in the air here over Texas and stuff. You know, it's, it's going to be everywhere around the earth. And so, uh, well, you know, around the time I was born, it was still blasting these stupid things off and stuff around Nevada and all these areas and stuff. You know, New Mexico, all this area, all that area was totally polluted and stuff, you know, and, and that radiation cloud was passing over the area in which uh, I had lived and stuff. I, was, I mean, I was born. So... You know, this stuff affected a lot of children from these explosions. 
and especially the ones who suffered through the time of, uh, uh, there in Japan itself. But they have proof of this. It says, it shows you what a lingering effect this has. The Chernobyl accident in Russia is still lingering, and supposedly that was an accident. Remember, this is still lingering, and it, it makes... The radiation has affected things, and it has affected the animals and stuff, and the animals are deformed and things like this, and the plants are growing. You know, some of the plants will grow really huge and stuff, but they're not fit for consumption, human consumption. You couldn't eat this stuff. You know, it's, it's completely contaminated, and it will be so for a very, very long time. And this is what the whole earth is going to be, and this is why we will have to end up taking a thousand years. Remember, it's going to take seven moons just to bury the dead, just to clean up the dead people off the face of this, this earth. And then we're going to have to start cleaning up the earth itself. That's going to be a real, a real job. Now, in the days of the voice of the seventh Molly, he's reading now and back from the book of Yahweh. But in the days of, I think it's verse 7, 10, Revelations 10, verse 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh Molly, when he will begin to sound, the great secret of Yahweh will be finished. Notice. The great secret, okay, that's when it will be finished. In other words, he says, this is the finishing touch. This is where you will receive the information that the other voices did not give to you. That was not written at that time as he declared to his servants the prophets. Brethren, we are it. We are it. Okay? We are the ones, this finishing touch, okay, that Yahweh is putting on us. And notice he says, this is where you were here. This is where, the house of Yahweh. This is where you will receive the information that the other voices did not give to you. It was not written at that time or declared to his servants, the prophets. They didn't understand these things. The prophets themselves wrote things down, but they didn't fully understand what they were actually writing. And one prophet would write something, and then hundreds of years later, another prophet could write something. And you're not going to understand what this prophet said unless you read what this prophet said. And you put them together here a little and there a little, and then it starts making sense. And then you can understand the, the, the full meaning of it. But we are it, okay? Remember now, notice again, he says, This is where you will receive this information that the other voices did not give to you. That was not written at that time as he declared to his servants the prophets, okay? They spoke. They gave a lot of information. They gave a lot of prophecies. But they never had the understanding of what they were really talking about. But remember, we are it. 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now, all these things took place with them, that is, all those who lived before us, as Hebrew 11 describes, as examples, okay? Theus Greek English lexicon says the teaching examples means the teaching which embodies the sum and the substance of religion and represents it to the mind. It's the pattern of conformity to which a thing must be made. It's an example to be imitated of men worthy of imitation. In a doctrinal sense, a type, a person, a thing prefiguring a future messianic person or thing. And notice it says, and they were written, it is written, they were written for our admonition. Calling attention to, the word admonition means calling attention to a mild rebuke or a warning, okay? So it was written for our own warning to call attention to these things. Uh, what? What? on whom the ends of the ages have come. Of course, this is our time period, the last days of mankind's rule. This is what it's for. Okay, this whole book of Yahweh was written for us. No one else. They didn't have the book of Yahweh. When did the book of Yahweh come into existence? Not until the house of Yahweh published it, right? You had to be a house of Yahweh in order to publish a book of Yahweh. Now, the house of Yahweh was not established until the last days. And so it's this last generation that actually has the entire book of Yahweh put together. Now, everything that all the prophets wrote, you know, everything that the prophets wrote was recorded. And those things were written down, and the things that the apostles wrote and what Yeshua wrote 
you know, and like he said, if, if everything that Yeshua talked about and taught was written down in the books, there wouldn't be enough books in the world to be able to hold everything because of all the stuff that was taught. But these things, the main things were written in the book of Yahweh. And it was all written down and put together and preserved for us in these last days. No one else before us had all the book of Yahweh together like we do. Okay? And so this is why we were able to teach these things on the sea of glass visions that people saw when they saw our image and they could see. Remember, the promise is, brethren, that you're going to overcome. One way or the other. <laughs> You're either going to choose to overcome and keep enduring. That's the way you overcome. You just keep enduring, 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 and keep striving, striving, striving. Okay? But you're promised. You're promised that if you continue on and you won't give up, you will be made like your creator. Now, being made like your creator, the scripture says you will actually see Yahweh as he is. Because he will be able to reveal himself to us at that time. Because we will be made in his image and likeness. And he will be able to reveal himself to us. And we will actually be able to see him. Now you can't. And all through the history of, the, of, the, of man's history, as you read in the book of Yahweh, no one ever saw his shape, his form, or heard his voice. You can't. You know? But at that time, when Yahweh's finished working with us, as Philippians 1, 2, 1 6 says, you know, that Yahweh's begun a righteous work in us and who will bring it to completion. Once it's completed and we'll be made into his image and likeness, then he will be ready to be able to reveal himself to us. Now, you know, and when you're made into his image and his likeness, like Yahweh, you're not going to be walking out there with a shovel, cleaning up and looking for dead bodies. You're going to be inspiring the others who are left alive to do the work and to lead and guide them. You'll be that voice like it talks about the prophets to hear in their ear, go this way, go that way, do this, do that. Because... You're going to be made into an image where they're not going to be able to approach you until they reach a certain state to where they can handle it, to where they can actually come before you and see you as you are. So he says here, you're the finishing touch. You are it. He says, notice the word finished. They will be finished. Okay? That's the people. That's us. We're going to be finished. We will be in the image and likeness of Yahweh. Verse 11, he said to them, you, now he says the word you is added. He said to, to me, this is how it reads. He said to me, this is Revelations 10, 11. He said to me, must prophesy be done again before many people, nations, and languages. Okay, highlight this whole thing here where he says, he said to me, must prophesy be done again before many people, nations, and languages, and kings. So this last or seventh Moloch, Seventh messenger, then is to go before kings. This is something Yeshua, the apostles, and the prophets never did. They never went before nations, languages, or kings. But in this day and age, we must. Okay, so highlight all of that. So, you know, the thing is, Yeshua and the apostles, remember he told me, he says, go out. And, and the, the last thing he said to Matthew was go out and teach the nations and stuff. But remember, they didn't, they didn't have access to the entire world like we do. We can access the entire earth. Every human being on the face of this earth can get this message out. Now, and, and if Yahweh allows it to go out to any areas, then they will receive it. Now, he says, if you remember, the sea here means many people, okay? Many people. That's a vocabulary word, too, I think. I didn't write it down, but I believe it is. The word see, it means many people. Okay, and that's written in Revelation 17, 15. I believe it is. So remember the description is given in Revelation. He says, if you keep that in mind, you will also understand that he is referring to here as the seventh Moloch. When we get more information on it right here. Now, right here you see that you must prophesy... Or prophecy must take place again 
by the seventh Moloch, or this work of the seventh messenger, before many peoples and nations and languages and kings. You see that? You must prophesy, or in other words, this prophecy must take place again by the seventh Moloch, this work, before many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. So this prophecy has to come to pass. The world has to see this prophecy. They have to be taught these prophecies, even though they don't understand them. We are a witness. It's not that we're here to convert the whole world, but we must be a witness to this world. Okay, we must be a witness of the light to the world because there's no way that we're going to convert the world. The wicked will never understand. It's not meant for them to understand at this time. So this work that we're doing right now has to reach out to the world. In other words, we testify to the world and also to kings. And now he, he talked about here in verse eight. He says, and the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the Moloch who stands upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went to the Moloch and said to him, Now remember, sea is, in, in, is, is, is the multitudes of people and so forth. It shows that, this, that what's in this book, this little book, okay, being the book of Yahweh, is the messages going forth throughout all the ends of this earth and to all people. Okay, and that's why it says he stands upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went to the Moloch and said to them, give me the little book. And he said to me, take it and eat it up and it shall make your stomach bitter, but it will be sweet as honey in your mouth. And as I took the little book out of the Moloch's hand and ate it up and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. And as soon as I ate it, my stomach was bitter, okay? Because, remember, the word of Yahweh is sweet, right? The law of Yahweh is sweeter than honey, it says, right? But when you have to realize what you have to do, <laughs> and it's revealed to you in the book of Yahweh, yeah, that's a different story, right? When the law is revealed to you, and now it's like, oh, you mean I got I to, gotta, well, I got to keep the Sabbath. I, I, I can't go out and do this and do that, you know, it's like, uh, wow, I can't eat that pork sandwich anymore. i got to stop all of that. Man, come on, you know, is it worth it? Well, that's when a person has to really realize, did he really give it up or not, you know? Now he says, if you think about what we have gone through, this word of Yahweh is sweet to us. It's very pleasant. It's very acceptable. It's seeing what will actually make us live forever. Get that. Meditate upon those words, brethren. Meditate upon what Yeshua said. That the flesh is useless, but the spirit is what would keep us alive. Okay? Because this blood that we have in our bodies keeps the flesh. Okay? It carries life within the blood. That's why you don't eat the blood. Because it carries life. It carries microscopic life in the blood, which causes us to this flesh to sustain itself okay but it can't keep us alive forever because it doesn't contain what we need okay because our bodies we know that you know you lose millions and millions of cells every second they're dying off which shows you that your body is renewing itself right and every seven years your body completely renews itself all your organs and so forth rebuilds itself but if they're sick with sin then of course within then they can't rebuild themselves and if they do start rebuilding, they're just going to be rebuilding dead cells. But we have the, we have the, the ability to, to reproduce these cells and for our bodies to remain alive. But we need the laws of Yahweh to keep us alive forever. Okay? And it's the laws of Yahweh that give life. And it's the uh, obedience to Yahweh's laws which will allow these cells to continue to produce, to continue to keep the body alive, to where nothing you know, we're, we're, we're hurted anymore. They're, all sickness and disease will be taken away. Because if you're obedient to his law, then all these things will be removed, as he said. So he says, it's seeing what will actually make us live forever, what will bring us joy and what will bring us peace, gladness, a perfect way of living. Notice, a perfect way of living. A perfect way. That astounds me because I, I, when I look back on top of page 126, the second paragraph, the very last thing it says, 
about the peace, the peace that Yahweh offers you in his way of life. You know, Yahweh offers you his way of life. It's a perfect way. So it is sweet to us when we speak of it, but it can certainly cause us ulcers in trying to present it to kingdoms and nations and languages. And yes, it's very bitter, and you must take this bitterness. It's going to have to go all to the world. Not to convert the world, of course, but as a witness, as Yeshua said in Matthew 24. Now, what is the seventh work of Yahweh, and what are the seven works of Yahweh? Let's go back here, he says. I know you've read this, and you've seen it in the books, and you've written, it's been written in the prophetic word. But I want you to get this in your mind, he says, before we proceed on what Yahweh then is bringing with this seventh work. Um, Revelations 1.10, he says, I was in the spirit, or I was in or had spirit holy, okay, the sacred spirit of Yahweh. I had the sacred spirit on the day of Yahweh, that great day, and I heard behind me a great voice as a trumpet. Notice, he's talking about the great day. He's talking about this time period, okay, when the voice that he hears, the great voice of the trumpet, is preaching the message of the end days and bringing this to a completion, he says, well, now you realize that on Sabbath, when pastor comes out and speaks, every time he speaks, when he's finished speaking, you know, we're just one more step closer to Yahweh because he's just fulfilled prophecy by speaking more about the plan of Yahweh, which is bringing it to completion. You understand that? He's bringing it to completion as he speaks, as he explains these things and expounds them. He says, well, he is just speaking of this now over here in another part in chapter 10. He says, if you remember, these are authorities who were given as workers in the house of Yahweh. But their message did not go forth at that time. They're coming forth at this time. This is to take place in the end as the finishing work. Okay? So even though Yahweh had people believing in works and so forth, like in Abraham and stuff, you know, he went to establish, you know, a, a, a people. He prepared them. Everybody that, everybody that had works that, that did these things were preparing the hearts and minds of these people. Okay, and that's why Revelation talks about, I mean, uh, Hebrews 11 talks about the works of all of these people. Okay, when Solomon built the house of Yahweh, okay, he built the place, and Yahweh says, you know, he says, I, that's, I, it's not going to be my dwelling place. You know, I don't dwell with anything made with hands, man, you know. But it was symbolic. And it, it showed that, the, you know, like, like it says in Proverbs, is it 1826 or 2618? Somebody it says where, where the, the righteous run into Yahweh. Yahweh's name is a strong tower, and the righteous run into it. You know, and, and, and the house of Yahweh itself, the building, the temple, which became known as the temple, okay, that's how it shows that they took away the name of Yahweh. By that time, the name of Yahweh was removed. It was no longer the house of Yahweh. It was called the temple, okay, and because they had done away with the, the teaching of Yahweh's name. But when it, when it was made, it was made a, a, a fantastic structure. You know, it was something that people really marveled about. And when, as people were traveling to go to Jerusalem to the feast, as they would be traveling and stuff, when they were distance away, they would see it being glistening with this white stone, sandstone that's out there as the sun would hit it and so forth. And they could see it from a distance off, you know, and they could see the beauty of it. And, of course, the gold and so forth on it would, would shine in the sunlight and so forth. But it was an example of, 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 a, of a structure, okay, and the house of Yahweh is not a building, but it's the people. It's the makeup. That's why this is the most beautiful place, because this is where the most beautiful people are. You know, This is where Yahweh is with his people. And this is what Yahshua talked about when he said that, you know, I and my Father would dwell with you. You know, we would dwell with you. So he says, this is the coming, this is the, the finishing work. They're coming at this time. Okay, He heard a trumpet. He says, now this is a messenger who is going to speak one day that he was hearing, so he was telling you this, okay? So this was something that was to come. 
Yachanan wrote these things down and he was being revealed these things, okay, as, as, as Pastor was speaking these things to him. You remember Yeshua told Pastor what to speak and his Pastor would sp- speak these things in, in a sea of glass vision to Yachanan and then Yachanan would record these things down for us. And he was speaking about something that was to come, okay? And then notice he says, I heard a trumpet, okay? Now, this is one of your vocabulary words, trumpet. This trumpet in the English, it means, notice, a person, a being, man or woman, who Yahweh would choose to bring something to the people, okay? That's what a trumpet is, a person that Yahweh would use to choose to bring something to the people because a trumpet is a blast, you know, if you all had your heads down right now reading and someone walked into the room and put a big old blast on the trumpet, everybody would certainly come to attention, right? Because it's loud, it's boisterous, it's, it, it pierces the air, okay? It's strong, okay? And that symbolizes the voice of Yahweh's last day's trumpet, his messenger. You know, when Pastor speaks up here, he doesn't need a microphone, you know, he can reach the audience. He could reach the audience just by speaking. You know, it would be no, no, no problem at all. Um, so it refers to the fact that this message is being brought forth loud and clear. Like you hear the sounding of a trumpet loud and clear. Okay? That's the way you hear the message coming forth. In fact, you remember the prophecies speak about that Yeshua would come, I mean that, that Pastor would come to make the message clear. Okay? He would make the message clear. So finishing uh, here in Revelations, you continue on, it says, saying, I am the Aleph and the Ta, the first and the last. Write what you see and write it in the book and send it to the seven congregations of the house of Yahweh to Ephesus. He says, we brought out in detail what these seven works over right here. Now, it's not like the Christians think that, oh, Yachalan wrote these things down and they sent them out to, all to these seven different locations, you know, that they had churches in each one of these, these cities and they sent them out to these different places, you know. It's talking about the works. And as Pastor said, each one of these works also refers to not only the, the era of the work of Yahweh, but also the different stages that we, each person goes through as you, as you read those things. You can see them in your life. Um, so he said, verse 12, And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw a golden... And he's talking about the golden lampstand. Now listen to this. Now he saw seven works here. He turned to see where this was coming from, but couldn't see it. This was something that was going to take place down the line. Something that had already taken place and something that was taking place in their time period at that time. Did you catch it? Did you catch it? It's a sea of glass vision. You see that? Listen to it. This was something that was going to take place down the line. Something that had already taken place and something that was taking place in their time period at that time, okay? This is something that Pastor was speaking about way back then, you know, but we just didn't comprehend it at that time. You know, it's here a little and there a little, as you see these things written down, but you can put on the side vision, the side margin right there, see a glass vision, because that's what it's describing right there. Something that was going to take place down in the future, and something that had already taken place, which was him writing these things down and stuff, and then something that was going to take place in their time period at that time. It's, it's amazing. The last one was the seventh notice. The ending or the finishing work of Yahweh in this time period. Okay? Time, time, time. Daniel spoke about the time, the time, the time. The prophet spoke about the time of the end. You know, it's this time period in which we live in today. No other time period is like the time period in which we live in today. And I saw a golden lampstand, golden seven lamp lampstand, seven burning lamps, in the midst of the seven lamp stand, one like the Son of Man. In the midst of it. 
That's the reason why you know, on Sabbath, when you see the menorah come out and we light, what's the first light that's lit? The middle, right? Because that represents Yeshua, who is standing in the midst of the, can- of the seven lamp stands, okay? And then we go through, and then the last one is the east represents Jacob's work, and the west represents Israel's work, okay? The, seven, the, the last two represent the works of the seven, I mean, of the, um, the two witnesses, okay? You know, and there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of work that was done by Jacob only with these sea of glass visions and stuff, with the work that he did with, with, with Israel throughout the time period of man that, that we don't really understand and know about right now because the main one was the seventh Moloch that he mostly presented in this work that would bring it to completion and so forth. But it's a lot more involved than what we, uh, you know, we really think about and just Odessa and him going to Israel and so forth. So you can see he was, he was heavily involved with these things. So Yeshua is well aware of our works. He's the inspirer under Yahweh, okay? He is the high priest of the house of Yahweh. And he's guiding this last work of Yahweh as he was guiding that work at that time, which was being done by the apostles. You know, and no one else understands the things that we do. No one else understands these sea of glass visions and these things that have taken place and how Yahweh used your image and likeness to be able to teach these people. But they saw these things, you know, they understood these things and they had hope. You know, they had hope. And this is why they could stand up, you know, to be to death itself, realizing that, hey, there's something to look for. And like it says that in, in, in eleven, in Hebrews eleven, that Abraham and stuff looked for a city, okay, whose maker was Yahweh. Well, he looked for Yahweh Shema. He looked for these things. He knew as they had these sea of glass visions, they were shown things and told about things. And this is what built their faith up and built their faith strong. This is how the, the, the prophets were able to remain so strong as they were, even up, up to death, to facing death, because they had that confidence. Remember the Apostle Shaul said, I know that I've run a race and I'm ready. And he had that full confidence. So he knew that he was going to end. He says he guided them up to that time. Now highlight this. At this time, he is the inspirer of this work, the last finishing work of Yahweh. Okay? He's the last finishing work. This is the last finishing work of Yahweh, and at this time, he's the inspirer of this work. For your reference there, you might want to put down Zechariah 4, verses 12 through 14. Zechariah 4, 12 through 14. Now, continuing here, he continues to read. It says, Hebrews 10, 21. Okay, Hebrews 10, 21. And having a high priest over the house of Yahweh. Now, re- realize, this tells you that Yeshua is our high priest. No other organization on the face of this earth can claim that because they don't have the name house of Yahweh there's only one house of Yahweh right as it says in Ephesians there's one faith and one house there's one calling and so forth and there's only one heavenly father there's not three as they say you know there's one father Yahweh and only the house of Yahweh has and can claim Yahshua Messiah as their high priest he says, we'll go back to Revelations in a minute. He says, we just have to spend a little time here in Hebrews. Now, highlight the rest of this verse. Having Yeshua over this house is what he is saying here. To guide, to protect, to inspire, to see to it that we get the right help. And see to it that we get the hardships, the trials, and prove ourselves to see to it that we get everything that we need at the same time we're doing the work of Yahweh. So, you are guaranteed to have your tests and trials and tribulation, okay? That's a given, okay? That's a given. You're going to get it, so you can praise Yahweh for that, right? That's why the Apostle Jacob said, count it all joy, right? He learned what it meant. He learned what this means, that he knew that the hardships would come, Okay, the trials would come, but we're going to have to prove ourselves. But don't forget that Yeshua is always there. He's always there to lead and guide us and to help us through these things because he went through them. 
Okay, so since he went through them, he's fully capable of guiding us through the rest of it, right? So while we're doing the work of Yahweh, notice, that's the key there. At the same time, we're doing the work of Yahweh. So by being involved with the work of Yahweh is how you can successfully make it through the hard times, okay? It's a great promise. Okay, and having a high priest over the house of Yahweh, or having Yeshua over this house at this time, okay? Remember the time, 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 time. Daniel spoke about time, this particular time period in which we live. Let us draw near with a true heart. Or notice it's a vocabulary word, true heart, that should be pure heart, okay? It means pure heart. Um, in full assurance of the faith. Let me show you the... the um, the actual, this was the correction of Hebrews 10, 20, 10, 22. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of the faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The correcting, correction that is, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of the faith, having been sprinkled, separating our hearts from the knowledge of evil and our bodies cleansed by water of the ashes of the red heifer, okay? That is the way that it was corrected, okay? And I forget what, what's... Uh, Pastor brought that in the sermon, too, and I'm trying to think of where it is, but you can find it in the book of... Um, in the book of Israel. Okay, so this true heart, this pure heart, he says, this is talking about being made pure by Yeshua, as you remember in one of the scriptures, he says, I don't want to read it now. He says, uh, because I've forbidden the priest to talk about it until next Passover, but he's going to come to perfection. This is when you're going to come to perfection, he says, and make a connection with Yahweh. Okay, so it means pure heart being sprinkled, okay? Pure heart being sprinkled. As the scriptures say by Yeshua, to get rid of a filthy conscience and to bring you to perfection. You remember it says, I believe in Ephesians, it says... Uh, about bringing every thought into subjection, okay, to Yeshua Messiah. Mm -hmm. Now listen to this. He says, Scriptures say that by Yeshua to get rid of a filthy conscience and bring you to perfection, where you can actually go boldly before Yahweh himself. You're going to do this. You will be invited before Yahweh. You will go with this as it has been done. He says, which we, brethren, we're going to come to perfection. We're promised to do so. We're going to go before Yahweh. First Jeconiah 3, it made me think of this verse here. First Jeconiah 3, verses 1 through 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of Yahweh. You know, think of how astounding this is that we should be called a son of Yahweh, our creator. Therefore, the world does not know us because it didn't know him. Remember, the world can't, they can't know us. The wicked can't understand anything. In verse 2, beloved, now are we the children of Yahweh, but it has not yet been revealed what we will be. Remember, it says, I has not seen, nor ear, nor heard, nor has it entered into the mind. The mind can't even comprehend any of these things. But, but we know that when he is revealed, that's when Father Yahweh himself is revealed, we will be like him. We will be like Yahweh. And we will see him as he is. You know, no, no one's ever seen his form or his shape or his voice or anything like that. But we're going to be able to see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure, striving to be like Yahweh to each other, right? That is just so astounding, you know, when you think about that. But, brethren, remember, not everyone's going to enter into that city. Remember, it tells us that, too. We have to really strive for this. If we strive for it. We'll meet the goal, we'll meet the guidelines to be able to enter into that city and actually partake of that and actually see Yahweh, meet with Yahweh. It's like, whew, man. Okay, so highlight the rest of this verse here. We are prof promised in the scriptures that Yahweh is going to use Yeshua, the high priest, over the house of Yahweh to bring us to perfection. Okay? We'll promise that. We're we'll promised in the scriptures that Yahweh is going to use Yeshua, the high priest, over the house of Yahweh. To bring us to perfection. 
because he's come to perfection, okay? And so as the high priest, he is able to lead and guide us and bring us to the same point, and he desires to do that. You know, Yahweh desires to see his family come to perfection. Now think about it. His original family, which he produced, turned from him. They left. He left the house of Yahweh. They followed the mother. And they went the other way. Now he longed to have a family. Now it was all in his plan beforehand. He knew it was going to take place. But then once it took place, then remember in his plan was that he would make mankind. And then he would make mankind and he would teach mankind and bring mankind up to the point to where we are now. To where he could bring us to perfection and make us into his image and likeness. And then we weren't born into his family as his original sons were, right? As his original sons and daughters, his original family was born. Therefore, we will be adopted into his family. And when we're adopted, then we will become the sons and daughters of Yahweh. And we will receive the inheritance. And that inheritance will be to be as Yahweh himself. That's a pretty heavy thought. You know? But that's the perfection that we're talking, talking about here. That Yeshua is willing to bring us up to that point. He's done it. He himself has done it. And he wants to bring us to that point. He says, now if you remember. All right, highlight this. The rest of this sentence. In the trials and all the incidents that took place. When the twelve tribes were brought out of the land of Egypt. They were tried 40 years in the wilderness. It was to do a work. Also highlight, he had to do a work with those people. Okay? He had to. He had to accomplish something. He brought them through, out of the land of Egypt. He brought them to Egypt to begin with. And then he brought them out of Egypt to do a certain work with them. Okay? And this certain work was, of course to get them, get certain people prepared and to get the certain genes and certain people ready to be able to bring forth the Messiah. And he says, many great prophets have come out of the work right here, those who were born during this time period. He says, I'm speaking to children here, brethren. You children may think that you're too young, but you're not. You hear that? Don't ever think you're too young. You're not too young. You can become like Yahweh himself. You desire that? You want to do that? All you got to do is just keep listening to, to, the, to your teachers and follow the instructions and follow your parents, and you can be just like that. And there's examples in the scriptures of it, too, of young children being kings and so forth. In fact, you know what? We have to follow y'all's example. That's how much y'all mean to us. You know that? We have to become as you are. We're children. <laughs> Praise Yahweh. So he says, you children may think that you're too young, but you're not. You can be used as Yahweh says of Daniel was, and even greater things than Daniel. Remember Daniel, you know, Daniel was only about 17 years old when he went into captivity. He was a teenager, you know. So even the teenagers can have to realize that, hey, <laughs> Daniel wasn't no old fogey, man. You know, he was a teenager. And look how wise he was. He was so wise that Yahweh told, told Satan, you're wiser than Daniel. And Daniel was a pretty wise person, Okay. And now we use them that way. Well, we need to stop here. Okay, we're going to stop here on the bottom of page 128. We'll take off here next week. Y'all, we bless your week, men.